Uh, welcome and good evening and good morning to everyone who's logged in from across the globe and India. We got slightly delayed because of a tech glitch, but thank you for your patience for waiting for us. Uh, from the Sports Management Division and from Geo Institute, we are continuing with the masterclass sessions. And today, very, very exciting and uh, you know thrilled to be introducing another member of our advisory body, Mr. Prashant Sean Das, who is the founder and chief business officer of Elevate Sports Group. Uh, he's based out of UK, but of course, the, the offices are across the globe. And he is also functioning and providing his services as the consultant to the president of the NFL team, San Francisco 49ers. Uh, as a, as a cohort, as a first cohort of this uh, sports management program, as the inaugural program, we have a fantastic, you know, group of people advising us on the course, deli I mean, course design and delivery. And Prasant is one of those people who is really excited about the program. Himself being of Indian origin, we look forward to receiving him at the campus during the next couple of months. And at the same time, Prashant, Prashant is excited about what he can deliver to the program from his experience. So while we were you know, deliberating about the topic that he might take up today, we thought, and in fact, Prashant, uh, Prashant recommended that it's too short a time to come up with something really like, you know, course oriented, that why don't we talk about something more interesting like storytelling? And this is where we are with the topic today. And promise you that this would be around sports and not just general storytelling. Of course, people have stories, but we would be focusing on sports. But before we get into the topic and I hand over the floor to Prashant, uh, a little bit more about the Institute. Uh, the Institute was launched last year with two main programs, the AIDS and the Digital Media and Marketing Communication. This year, we are launching the Sports Management and Journalism program. Uh, while our admission cycles are ongoing, we are closing the date by the end of April, uh, and at the moment we are continuing with the master classes in order to introduce our advisors and faculty members. Towards the end of this session today, we'll be opening up the floor for program-related question and answers, and then we pass on the floor to the admissions team for the admissions-related queries, if there are any. So, Prashant, uh, thank you very much for your time today, and welcome once again to Geo Institute. I hand over the floor to you for your session and the masterclass. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much. I'm just making sure everyone can hear me. Good. All right. Yes, thank you so much for having me, and um, I'm delighted to be here um, from the moment Dr. Sutton asked about uh, being involved with this program. He's been a, a mentor to me. He's been a mentor to my, my work bosses and colleagues, and I couldn't think of a better way than to, to be a part of this, this program and, and what a fantastic way to learn. So really, thank you for having me. Um, so yes, my name is uh, Prashant Das. I'm in this audience, it's easy to say. Uh, I, I go by Sean most of the time because people usually can't pronounce Prashant, but my parents are from uh, Bangalore and Chennai, and I grew up in the US. And spent a lot of time in Canada, so I was uh, been back to India many times with the family. And I want to talk to you guys today about storytelling and the importance of storytelling. So I will share my screen, and let me get, make sure this is going. Just give me one minute. Okay, we still can see everything, correct? Okay, great. So. The important piece of storytelling is that storytelling is more than just, okay, can I tell a great story and uh, describe something in a good manner? Storytelling is really the fundamental and basis of, of my life. And, and really it comes in the form of three areas. It's the story you tell yourself every day and how you get out of, uh, out of bed every day, how you show up every day. It's a story you tell the world every day. So what's the story you're communicating with everyone else? and the story you tell when you need it the most. So this is a story you tell when you're going for your next job interview, when you're applying to this type of program, when you're finding your new husband or wife or girlfriend, when you're pitching your next big deal. Uh, storytelling is a huge, huge part of my life and, and really everyone's life. So I want to spend some time talking about it. Um, so my story, like I said, I uh, am an, an Indian, was born in California. But I grew up, when I was six months old, I moved to Canada in the middle of the country, a province called Saskatchewan. And I grew up there for 16 years, had a great childhood. And in the middle of high school, 
I moved to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. My father got a job doing cancer research and he got a job in Philadelphia. So I moved from Saskatchewan, Canada to Philadelphia. I didn't really know where I wanted to go to college. And in America, college is a big, big thing there. So you take these standardized tests called SATs and you, you apply and it's a really big to do there. And I ended up applying to a school called Penn State. And I got into Penn State and I had a great time there learning. I was, um, and I know I can't see you, but uh, I, being a, uh, coming from a family of Indians, my dad's a doctor, my brother's a doctor. And uh, there was an expectation that I was going to be going down the route of medical or some sort of science-based program. So I started in biology. And after the first semester, I realized biology wasn't for me. And um, I'm guessing a lot of you, if you're entertaining sports, you may, you may face this similar difficult conversation or you might have already, whereas talking to your parents and talking about the career path you want to choose. So I told them, hey, I don't really want to be in, in um, science, but I want to go into business. So I did a four-year undergrad major in finance. And when I was a senior in college, I didn't wake up reading the Wall Street Journal every day. I was still going to sports sites like ESPN.com and NHL.com, NFL.com. And I found out uh, as a senior in college on Friday afternoon, right before I was graduating, so three months before I graduated, I looked at NHL.com and I saw the Phoenix Coyotes were hiring. And that's a hockey team. In, in, in the US. And it said part full time sales role um, inside sales. And I was like, what the heck does part full time mean? Um, again, growing up with a family of doctors, they were not going to be happy with me graduating college and starting a part time job. So I called in and I said, hey, I'm interested in this project, uh, this, this, this inside sales job, but can you tell me more about it? They transferred me directly to the director of sales. We had a good conversation and he said, call me Monday at five and I'll interview you. So I'm thinking, okay, wow. Like I know I want to be in sales. It's the Phoenix Coyotes, a hockey team, a sports team. And at that time, their head coach was a guy named Wayne Gretzky. I'm guessing most of you on the call have probably heard of Wayne Gretzky. He's um, the, the greatest hockey player of all time. So it's equivalent to your Michael Jordans and LeBron James, and Tom Brady's of the world. And sort of the Canadian kid, I'm thinking, wow, this is great. Like maybe I get a job selling hockey tickets. So Monday at 5 p.m., I was in Penn State. They always said, dress like the way you want to present yourself. So I put on a little blazer that I had. I sat up straight. It was way before Zoom. So I gave him a call. And Monday at 5, he didn't answer. So I'm like, okay, that's weird. Then I called him again an hour later. He didn't answer. I called him again the next day. He didn't answer. I called him again the next day. He didn't answer. I called him again the next day. He didn't answer. I emailed him the next day again. He didn't answer. I called him the next day again. He didn't answer. For 43 days in a row, I emailed him. Uh, I called him twice a day and I emailed him about eight times. And on that 45th day, I was thinking, man, maybe he's just not interested in what I have to offer. Maybe he doesn't want to talk to me anymore. So I was about to give up, but I decided to send one more email. And I said, hey, I'm a young kid trying to get my start here. And um, what happened? You were so interested to talk to me, but what happened now? About two days later on the 47th day, he called me back and he said, hey, I think you earned your start here. And I, my jaw dropped. I was like, what the heck? You didn't answer my call, but I kept being persistent for 45 days. And now you're hiring me. So on May 21st, I graduated Penn State University. And on June 1st, I started um, as inside sales at the Phoenix Coyotes. And wow, what it taught me was the importance of being positive, um, knowing that he, he said he wanted to talk to me. But then after that, he... Um, <clears throat> <laughs> excuse me. Um, he said he wanted to speak with me, but after that, he didn't answer for 45 days straight. So I was wondering, um, like, oh man, maybe he didn't, he didn't like it, but I kept a positive attitude. I was very passionate. So I didn't lose any passion for where I knew I wanted to get to, which is this new job. And I was persistent. And I think a lot of times people try, they get negative right away. Someone doesn't call them back. They don't get an answered email and all of a sudden they quit. And I learned very early on in that job interview process that it was so important to be positive, passionate, and persistent. And I started my career at the Phoenix Coyotes. So I was there for about three years. Um, I've moved through the sales ranks. And the most, the most interesting part about sales is, is that there is no silver bullet. There's no silver bullet to jobs. There's no silver bullet to any of these places. 
the the silver bullet is is fundamentals and hard work. And I I was then moved on from there to the Atlanta Hawks. After the Atlanta Hawks, I was there for about four years in management roles. Um, after that, I moved on to the Philadelphia 76ers and New Jersey Devils for more management roles, at which point I got my MBA at Columbia University. So wanted to continue to get my education, just like you guys are thinking about now. And after that, I helped open a football stadium in Madrid in Spain, where I'm sitting right now. Um, and after that, the guy who hired me at the Phoenix Coyotes, the story I started with, he and I then founded an agency called Elevate Sports Ventures. And that's what Rajeshree and everyone introduced me as. We founded this agency five years ago. So if you can believe the person who hired me in sports at this point, oh God, now I'm feeling, what, what, when was it? So 15 years ago is the same person we started this agency now that we'll talk about more today. So that to me is, it, it, it just shows you the importance of people and storytelling. And, and why I want to share that story is I wanted to now talk to you about what makes a good story. So let's do a review on what makes a good story. And let's see if I, if I um, hit these details. So the first one, why should the listener care? So it's really important. And I'm not talking about a story you're just writing for fun. I'm talking about a story here, uh, a story that um, you're telling to people. Like, why should you care? Well, hopefully in this instance, it's you're caring because you're trying to uh, learn more about a career path, learn more about what this industry could offer you. Does it reveal the characteristics of the people involved? This is very important, guys. When you're telling a story, you want to reveal the characteristics um, of the people involved. Because me telling you a story of how I got my first job, hopefully, I don't have to sit here and tell you I'm hardworking or persistent. Hopefully, you're able to, to reveal that through the story I told you. Is it clear and easy to understand? So it's important when you tell a story that hopefully the, the message is clear um, and maybe in the chat or someone will tell me if it was clear to understand the story I told you about how I grew up and how I got into the industry. Um, a good story always has a bit of adversity or conflict. So in this case, I didn't get answered for 45 days. So I was really disappointed, but I persevered through it. Uh, details and customization. So always having believable, real details when you're telling your story. So whether it is how you sat in the conference room or how many times you called, what did the email say? Um, and then every story should have a theme to it. And lastly, the style, pace, tone, language, you have to make the story your own flavor. Rajeshree, Dr. Sutton, they'll tell stories different than I will. And you have to make sure that you tell the story the way you want it. Okay. So um, now let me give you a, an example of this. Let me see, is there, was there a question there or no, is that? Um, I don't know if there's a question, Roger Shree, or if I keep going. Happy to take any on the way. I, I see. What's that? We should keep going now. Okay, great. Okay, so now I'm gonna tell you a personal story of uh, the Marathon de Sablo. This is a race I ran uh, last year. I'm going to tell you this story in a work story. I'm going to share the same principles we just discussed, and I'm going to show you how storytelling makes a big difference, okay? So every day, uh, every year, I set uh, every year a goal that I call a first day of school goal. So what can you do to put something on your calendar that is so impactful that'll change the next 364 days of your life. So I think of these goals as something so big that you get those butterflies in your stomach. So hopefully if, uh, when you apply to this program and you get accepted, uh, you will get those butterflies because you're doing something that's different. So for me, what that goal was, was the Marathon de Sable. The Marathon de Sable is what's been dubbed as the, the, the toughest foot race on earth. It's 250 kilometers across the desert in Morocco. And you have to, it's self-supported. So you carry what you need for the whole uh, seven days, all your food, your, your sleeping stuff, your toilet paper, everything, everything you need. The only thing they give you over those days are medical assistance if you have a problem. And they have... Um, water that they give you each night when you end your during the race and at the end so for me this was a goal that holy cow i saw this and i'm like how the heck am i going to get this done i've done a bit of running in my past but this is something so far above what i've what i've done 
So what I had to do then was, is, oh, well, here's the breakdown of the days. Whoops. You can see that the first day, this is the mileage or the kilometers of, of each day and how it adds up to there. So it was quite, quite an intense process going up and down through sand dunes. And so the first thing I had to do, just like my sales career in sports, is have solid fundamentals. So I won't go through everything, but I ate the same thing every day. I had the same food packed in, in different Ziploc bags, and I had the exact amount of ratios for protein and carbs that I needed to fuel me along the day. Because if you remember, you only have what you take. So just like in my sales career, fundamentals are such a big, big thing. Um, and this is what it looks like. So if you see there, I've got all the bags of food for seven days, my hiking poles, my shoes with gaiters, my backpack, my sleeping bag, some slippers for the night, and one extra change of clothes. And for seven days, that's all I could have. Um, I Let me I'll go by that. So the way I mentally did this was, is I said to myself that the only two things are going to happen at the end of this race. I'm going to either hit my goal or I'm going to push as far as I possibly can go until I can't go any further. And that mindset was non-negotiable for me. I said, that's it. Like, I'm going to be taken off the course or I'm going to push as far as I can go until I can't go any further. Then um, let me go to the next slide. Oops. Sorry, let me get to the next slide. Uh, Pre-race, here are some pictures just to give you a, a sense of the the atmosphere. Okay. And then the sleeping arrangements. So you get an idea. You don't have any um, actual like accommodations. You have these two sticks here with the tarp over you and you sleep on the sand there with your sleeping bag. Okay. And, and this is what it looks like when you wake up. Uh, not, not, not. So I know it may have been hard to hear that or see that, but basically you are just, um, they, they come to you and they rip off your tent and you have to get ready to start, uh, to start going. So you take your feet and you get going for the day. Here we are at the start line. The terrain is really crazy guys. So it is not just sand. It's, it's all it's sand dunes, like the big fluffy pillowy sand, but it's also these hard salt beds. There is also um, long flat stretches, which are nice. And then there's also rocky cliffs where you have sheer drops on each side. So that makes this tough because your feet get really bruised and beat up throughout the race. Along the way, they have some course markings, so hopefully you don't get lost. Um, and then at the end of each day, you come in and you treat your feet and your blisters. And you try to sleep it off and get ready for the next day. So in what happened to us in the races, in this race, the, the winds got so extreme that you can see here. Um, actually, let me, let me go to the next slide. You can see here. That basically, I, I don't think video buffers really well over here. So I, I, I think the idea you'll see is that it became a big windstorm. So ultimately, people had a lot of trouble getting to get through the race. And I had a mantra that I used that I will move forward. So I just said, at every moment of this race, no matter how hard it gets, I will just move forward one step at a time trying to get through the race. And I used that no matter how hard it was. And even when we got there, our whole sleeping arrangement was taken down by wind. And I think it's so important to have a positive, positive mindset to get through challenges. Okay. Um, then on day three, we had another long day and I'll go through these um, fairly quickly. You can see here, just to get an idea of some of the sand. I know the video doesn't load super fast, but you can see there's deep sand and, and uh, cliffs and you're sort of walking down and it's like you're sinking in. Um, it's some of the most beautiful places I've ever been, but it also makes it really challenging to run a race there. 
Um, okay. And, and then what happened was for me, right before the long day, which is 54 miles, I ended up having some severe foot problems. My left foot swole up really large. You can see it on the left side. I lost some toenails as well. And oh boy, I had some lip blisters because it was windy and, and cold there. It wasn't actually really hot. I had a lot of lip blisters. And next thing you know, we had um, a, a 50 mile day to do. And, and you know, there, there's one thing that I learned in this that there's a relationship between pain and suffering. And when you know that you're going through something difficult, you're going to have a lot of pain. But if you resist the pain, that's when you start suffering. So, for example, if you lose your job, if you lose a big sales pitch, it's going to feel bad. If you disappoint your parents, it's going to feel bad. Of course it is, because you disappointed someone. The only time that pain becomes suffering is when you resist it. So what I really learned here is, is that if I was trying to complete a race that I had to practice for a full year about, that there's no way it was going to feel good the whole time. And the minute I resisted that, if I said, oh man, I should be feeling great, that's when I started suffering. Instead, I said, you know what? This is how it's supposed to feel. But this is why I train for 365 days a year. And that is when I learned that when pain comes in your life, you can't always resist it. You have to embrace it because then you won't suffer. Um, then we got to day four, and I'm actually gonna skip, skip to the end just for time. And, and, and show you that after uh, a 20-hour day, after many long days in the desert, we finally ended up at the finish line. So what I was able to do uh, is, is finally cross the finish line of the Marathon de Sable. You can see that was a picture from the webcam, me with the race organizer, and uh, don't normally drink Coke, but that was the greatest. We, you know, we had to eat our food the whole week. So me getting to drink a can of Coke and something else that wasn't my same food that I showed at the beginning was, was one of the greatest uh, feelings in the world. And of course, there was our, our medal and, um, and race kit. And, 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 you know, then the last day you have a little charity walk, which at that point you barely can even walk, but you get to celebrate. And, uh, and, and ultimately, I accomplished a big goal of mine, which was running the marathon of solid. And through that story, I learned so many things. And I'm not going to go through all of them here, but I, I learned, I learned that um, the benefit of setting a huge goal. I learned what fundamentals do for myself and my career and my life. I learned about the relationship between pain and suffering. I learned about how telling myself something every day, like I would say, I'm strong. Every time I was taking a step, I'm strong. I'm strong. I will move forward. I learned the, the value of saying things out loud to myself. Yes, I might have sounded crazy out there, but everyone was crazy out there. So I learned a lot of things with these things. And then I, I learned how to be comfortable with discomfort. And I think that's something that, um, you know, I don't know if, if our, from, if, if most people aren't comfortable with, being, uh, with discomfort, and that's something that I, I think is really important. So, um, and at the end of the day, the biggest thing I learned is you always achieve your standards. You can set lofty goals. You can say, hey, I'm going to run a marathon tomorrow. I'm going to go read 10 books tomorrow or in the next year. But whatever your standards are, whatever you do day in, day out, are what you end up defaulting to when things are going tough. So if we, if we, that was the, the, the personal story there of the Marathon de Sable. So at the end, we can, when we do the question and answer, we can recap on, did I hit the elements of a good story? Was I clear? Did I give everyone a reason to listen? Did I have a great message? And so on and so forth. Um, and now I'm going to share a work story before the, the Q&A. Rajasri, anything else before any, anything else? Or shall I keep going? I think it's fine, Sean. Great. Okay. So in... Well, let's talk about storytelling from the work side. St. Louis City SC is an MLS soccer team in the U.S. And they, we were under in a situation where they were going to choose our firm Elevate with the gold slashes here or our competitor Legends. They were going to hire one of us for sponsorship or um, 
hospitality sales. So as most people know, or, or probably could guess that sponsorships, so naming rights, jersey, patches, um, founding partners at stadiums, any brands that will pay money to a team, and ticket sales and premium sales are the two biggest revenue streams for any team. So we were in a position where we were able to pitch for this business for a new MLS team and stadium. Um, and when we pitch our, our, when we pitch our clients, there is one way to go about pitching. We can go in and tell everyone, here's how good we are. Here is how to sell. Here's what we've learned over the last 10 years. Here's what you say to the prospect on the phone. Here are the 20 companies you can call. That is certainly one way to sell. You can tell people, come in and say, here's exactly what you should do. And we'll buy the best for it. The way we approach this, which will not surprise you after the first part of the call, is we approach this through storytelling. We say, what if um, we told a story to St. Louis City to see if maybe we could win over their hearts and talk to them about why we are the best firm in to do their work? And what happens as consultants is a lot of times people understand that consultants are smart but they want to know, can they fit in with the fabric? Will they be a good partner when all is said and done? So in our presentation to St. Louis City, I'm going to share part of this presentation with you. I'm not going to share the part where we talk about how to sell the sponsorships and the ticket sales, because that stuff, you know, you'll have plenty of classes on that, or we can talk about it later. But here's where the secret sauce was. Instead of just showing up on pitch day, we spent uh, a week in St. Louis researching so we researched what it meant to be like from St. Louis. So if you picture this for a minute, imagine you're sitting there, you're in a boardroom with the executives and ownership group of St. Louis City SC. And now there's a firm coming in and they're telling you, hey, like I get we're smart, but you know what? I wanna to talk to you about what we learned about your beautiful city. So we showed them that we went around to all the food. Here's me with some colleagues. We tried the local beers. We had local, uh, some of the local food. We then went through and went through all the sites. We went to their famous places. We sat for a drawing, went to the St. Louis Arch. We went to their famous um, landmarks. This is the Hall of Fame of Chess, believe it or not. They've got the, the Hall of Fame of Chess in St. Louis, Missouri. We then went to the sporting venues. So we did competitive research. So imagine you're sitting in a room and someone's pitching you about working with them and now you're showing them that you've taken the time to get to their area. Um, the soccer park, we went to their soccer park, which is this, what we learned when we got there is soccer is so, they're so passionate about soccer in St. Louis. So what we learned was, is that it was in their DNA. So we went and talked to folks at the local parks. And we summed it up in what we call human truths. We said, these are the words. We did interviews all week. We took videos. I won't show it here because it's hard to show, but we took videos. We talked to people. And these are the words that we heard about St. Louis. Community, honest, family, team, sports, hard work, resourceful. Um, this is, it, all these words are what we heard. And we distilled them down to human truths. So we said, if you figure out what is true to your community, excuse me, true to your people in St. Louis, that's how you should approach selling the market. So we said community. We told stories about what we learned and why community was so important there. Everyone asked, which high school did you go to? Because that's how close they are, because they're from there. They had pride. They said this. They said that um, the Cardinals are the heart, the Blues are the soul, and the MLS team will be the pride of the city. You don't really get that in most cities. In a lot of cities, the teams don't like each other. It was very loving, kind, and faith-based. This was a quote we got from someone in one of the bars. We're kind, loving, and respectful. If someone wears a rival's hat, we ask them how they're doing, and we hope they enjoy their city. It's not about upmanship here. It's about sportsmanship. We learned someone does something great, you congratulate them and strive to make yourself better. I mean, this is what we heard from their city. And we learned they're, they're resourceful. They have the eight most championships in North America, but yet they're the 19th biggest city 
So if that doesn't tell you they're scrappy, what does? And we learned that they're honest and real. They're hardworking people and they just try to get their job done. So what happened was after that pitch, we then went through the other 45 minutes of nuts and bolts of how we would sell the arena, how we would be their best partner. And at the end of the day, uh, believe it or not, uh, Doc, Doc, if you're on the, on the line still, you, you know these people, but Carolyn Kindle Betts, the owner of Enterprise Rent-A-Car, they were in tears. They were in tears because they were like, wow, you guys really came to understand our community. And all I was thinking is, is no, I was just telling you a story of what we learned in your beautiful place. And that's the only thing we can do. Because if we're to come in and work for your club, we have to learn and understand what you do. And that ability to tell that story was the reason why we were able to get them as a client. And they just celebrated their opening day at the MLS stadium about a month ago. So what, what an amazing, what an amazing thing. So to recap now, before we get into some questions, the story you tell, you tell yourself every day is so important. I mean, I don't, I, I, I wake up every morning and say, today's going to be a great day. I think about what I'm grateful for. And I tell myself I'm going to win the day and winning the day might look different today. I'm not feeling great. So I'm sniffling a bit. So, okay. So I have all the reasons to be not happy. Maybe I want to do a, a 12 mile run today, but I only did eight. Okay. That's okay. But I tell myself every day that this is going to be the greatest day. And what's the story you're telling the world every day? So how are you coming off? So first you have to start with yourself. But then how are you coming off every day to your colleagues, your friends, your family? And then the story when you, you tell them you need it the most. That's the one we talked about. That was a story about how I got my first job. That was a story when I was on day four of a seven-day race, and I was 50 miles into a day, and I was in the worst day of my life. And it was a story I told St. Louis City when we met with their executives. So to, re to recap what makes... Oh, I'm sorry. To recap what makes a good story, you should always have a reason for people to care. You should reveal characteristics of the people that are involved, and that should be you. When you're telling a story, use the story to teach people about who you are and why you are the way you are. Make sure it's clear and easy to understand. Uh, if there's adversity or conflict that you can draw into, it makes for a great story. Use great details, have a theme, and then tell it the way you want it. So for me, you saw I like pictures, videos. I like to show them what I was feeling. If we had this in person, I can show you all the videos and you could hear the wind blowing over my face. You could see the steepness of the cliffs, but I like to do that. Some people have different flavors. And lastly, I'll leave you with these action items before we get to some questions. Here's three things or four things I do. One is I make a story about yourself and rehearse it and practice it for your employers, associates, and coworkers. Uh, I know people always talk about make an elevator pitch, do this, do that. Like you need to, what is your story? What are the key elements that make you who you are? What it, are people going to be interested to hear about? And practice that story. Tell it to your friends, tell it to your parents, tell it to your cousins, tell it to your coworkers, tell it in the interview when you go through this process. Define your mantra or stories you tell yourself every day. For me is I will move forward. I use a slogan that a friend taught me called remember tomorrow says, remember tomorrow, what, remember tomorrow when you're taking an action today. If I go for, I went for an eight mile run this morning, remember how I feel tomorrow by doing that. And if I didn't do it, how will I feel? If I decide to eat 10 donuts right now, remember how I'll feel tomorrow. So what are those stories and mantras you tell yourself? And then you practice and rehearse. You reach out when you need to tell the story. Um, you, you, you go over it over and over again. That St. Louis city story, we went through that for hours and hours. We collected the data, we practiced, we practiced. Um, and then lastly, of course, if you have any questions, you can catch up with me on Instagram or email if you have more detailed questions than the ones in the chat or that we'll go through now. So um, yeah, I, I hope that was impactful and, and helpful. And uh, I'm looking forward to some dialogue on it now. It uh, looks like there's a couple of chats here, Rajeshri, but I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Yes. Thank you so much, Sean. Uh, we do have a couple of questions over here. Uh, there's Ankur, okay. uh, who is very inspired by your personal story, and he has a question to ask. He's asking, uh, what are the key points to keep in mind while talking about stories from your personal lives? 
including our battles or hardship. I mean, you partly went through that. Let's speak about it, but yeah, just to answer his yeah. question. I think, it, um, I think if it's if how if it's relevant, I think there's I don't I don't really put a boundary on it, Ankur. So for example, um, let me tell you a story I wouldn't share because it's irrelevant, but let me tell you a story I would share. When I go to any interview now, including when I was, you know, launching this agency and doing other things, I'm not going to tell the story about how um, my college girlfriend dumped me and I was in I was in a bad place for a year, which I was, because it didn't really play to what I was talking about. But I did tell a story about what it was like when they asked me about hardships. I always tell people the story I told you at the beginning about I don't know, most people that are not on this call or that are not from where we're from don't understand the challenge it is to go into a sports field when you grow up with a family of doctors and you come from a place like, my dad's one of the smartest men in the world. He's got a, uh, he's got two PhDs, Carnegie Mellon, IIT, and you know my brother's a doctor, my older brother. And then me not going into that field is a hardship. And like people don't, most people don't understand that, but that's a story I talk about. Like, hey, you know, I may have not lived in the streets, but certainly there were hardships I went through. So I actually wouldn't shy away from it. I think it teaches people more about you. And the more stories you tell, provided they're positive, they get to know, you get to learn a lot about someone. So for example, on this, on this, um, this speech today, not one person says, tell me, tell me how hardworking you are. Tell me if you're driven. No one's asked the question saying, you know, um, why do you think you're the best candidate for a sales rep? But I assume, and guessing by a few of the comments, that after this story, you could send me a note, you could send your friend a note, you could text them and say, hey, I learned these five things about Sean because he told me three stories today. I just told you three stories. I told you about myself. I told you about a race I ran, and I told you about a work presentation. And I think, I believe that you should at least get four or five characteristics about what you generally think of me now through these stories. So I actually wouldn't shy away from many of those unless it's just totally irrelevant. Um, but obviously, if there is anything you'd like to discuss or if I can be helpful, like I said, feel free to email me or chat me on Instagram. And I'm happy to give you more feedback personally. Uh, I see someone asked if you get the PowerPoint. Unfortunately, we have some client material in there, so I can't give you the PowerPoint, but I'm happy to give you the first uh, the first slide to write the street and send them out. I mean, obviously, I don't mind if you have my race slides, and I also, if 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 the storytelling template's great, obviously happy to share. I just can't share that in between stuff because it's it's more private with the client. Um, yeah. Yes, Encore, great. Yeah, ex exactly. That's a great thing. I, I would definitely do that. I would uh, make sure you practice not shying away from talking about battles, but make it relevant. Yeah, that's exactly right. Thank you so much, Sean. I also really enjoyed the part where you said that in, in, the, in the entire process of storytelling, uh, you mentioned about telling the stories about the people who are there in your stories, you know, making them more... Uh, representing them in your stories. That is something that I've never thought myself in my, I mean, generally when I think about, you know, these kind of um, practices in a way, but that's really interesting because that adds a more layer to what you have to share to the world and uh, it, it makes it that much more interesting. So that's something that I learned new today. Yeah, that's great. That's, it's a great point. And I think that um, also for, for those folks that will be applying here and even if it's not here and they're going to go for a job one day, I would really encourage you to think through that when anyone, when anyone asks you an interview question, I would think in your mind that the first line you say, even though you're not going to say it out loud, is let me tell you a story about how I'm hardworking and then go into your story. So what I mean by that, Rajasri, is if, if an interview question is typically tell me about a time uh, like, you know, are you a hard worker or tell me about a time, you know, that you've, you've went through adversity. Instead of just saying, oh, yes, I'm a hard worker, tell a story that actually exhibits those characteristics. So I think in that sense, Saradashri, I would think about that, that anytime anyone asks you a question, try to orient it to answering it through a story. So then you're getting a real flavor of who you are and who the people around you are. Um, because that's the way to read the room. Uh, I do think that when I meet people in business, 
like today, when I go to the meeting in the next boardroom, they're going to say, hey, nice to see you. Nice to meet you. And they're going to say, oh, how long have you been here? I'm going to say, hey, I, I got in late last night. I woke up in the morning and I ran eight miles to the top of that mountain that you can see in the background. I came back. I had a few work calls. I called my family. And now I did a, a presentation to uh, an institute I'm working with in India. And you know why I say that, Rajeshri? Because then guess what? After that, they've already learned five or six things about me. Okay, he's dedicated. He, okay, he, he's passionate about fitness. Wow, he, he's a family guy. He's all his kids and wife. And, and lastly, um, he likes giving back or, you know, he's, he's involved in the school. That's, that's pretty unique versus just saying, oh, nice to meet you. I'm good. You know, or I could have told the same story and just said, yeah, I got my first job at the Phoenix Coyotes after I graduated Penn State. That's one way to tell the same story. I said at the beginning, but which one's more impactful? So exactly right. Right. Absolutely. Um, just diverting a bit over here, uh, you're sitting in Spain at the moment. Uh, you work all over the world and you also help set up the, the stadium over there. Uh, you've seen uh, students and uh, professionals across the globe. Do you see any difference in, in their, you know, uh, when they see sports management as a career or, you know, working in sports as a career? Do you see any difference or they come with the same kind of aspiration with a lot of possibly not knowing too much, but with a lot of dreams and aspirations and how does this really take form and is it exciting? Yeah, it's a, good, a great question. I, what I would say is that um, like for myself, when I was in, I was a finance major and I didn't know that a world of sports existed, like Dr. Sutton has done an amazing job building these sports programs now where the students on this call uh, potentially will get to do a, a full education with the system. Um, what I've learned is that most of the time people are passionate about some element of sports and entertainment. So it might be like me where I love sport. I love sales. And oh, by the way, I also love hockey. So why didn't I get started there? I noticed people here in Spain, they might like football or motor racing more than an American. Then they like baseball because an American likes baseball. But what I've noticed is that the characteristics that make us all successful are similar. People are hardworking. They execute the fundamentals. Like what I would tell you is this, is that when I was in inside sales and the story I told you to get my first job, I do the same things in a different way that I'm doing now after founding an agency and selling global deals. It's still the same fundamental. It's still calling the prospects. It's still telling a great story. It's being positive. It's, um, it's not settling. It's pushing the boundaries. And I've noticed that the best people in our industry around the world have those same characteristics. I think the beauty of our industry is you can flex it any way you want. If yeah. you're analytically inclined, if you're marketing inclined, if you're sales inclined, if you're community relations inclined, if you're athlete inclined, if you're broadcasting inclined, I mean, all these career paths exist. But I think for me, the most important thing is, is find the type of work you like to do. So if you like the sales and getting out there or you want to try that, then try that with a sports team. If you don't like sales or you don't think you'd be good at it, and for many reasons you don't want to try it, then then go try the analytics side of the sports team, right? So I think finding which is your niche and then go after that aggressively, and that's what I would do. Right. And also that the last part of what we do is centered around the human aspect of it, right? It's people business. And and that is where I think like, you know, skills like communication and of course, like storytelling now, like, you know, to make it more dynamic and interesting and really to make, make that connect with people, have an open mind and take the best possible opportunity that comes in your way and then work yeah. for the, yeah, the hustle that you need to put in. Yeah, I think generally with the, um, you know, I guess it's okay to say because we're, I'm Indian too, but I think generally that's where we don't do a great job generally. I find that um, people from our background generally, and I know I'm making generalization here, but we don't necessarily go out there. We're not the most risk-taking groups. I mean, you know, like when I tell my parents I'm running these races, they're like, can't you just run five miles and be happy? Like, you know, it's the typical Indian way of things in moderation and like not really getting out there. Um, and I think that's what holds people back from being great. I'm sure that of the 62, 46, however many people were on, <clears throat> people are have so many great things to offer the world. They have so many great things to offer your program. They have so many great things to offer their own family and friends, but they don't um, come out of their shell and expand and experience. And I think that's so important. And I, and I would say that at the end of the day, 
it's actually not the brilliant material that they learn in the course. It's how they get to apply that and tell the story and how they get to use that and the people they meet. And that's something that I don't think we do very well. So if, if I had one urge for the group listening, it's, <laughs> I would think about, it's not necessarily about what you know, it's about who you know. And I think the Indian culture, we've been taught always, it's, it's only about what you know. And if your marks aren't high, you're not gonna go anywhere. But I don't think the real world works that way. So that'd be my feedback is like, if you could learn and grow in a different way, I would think about that side of it versus the traditional Indian way. Yeah, and I think that's where the our, at least our program is pushing the envelope because say for example, yeah. we have this, among everything others, keeping everything else <laughs> side, we have this internship module, uh, which is completely different from anything that's being offered in India at the moment. Uh, I can like, I can vouch on that. The point being like they start working so early into the program, uh, it's hands-on, they go out into the field, they, they come back to the institute, course correct themselves and again go back to the industry, keep the work real throughout the year and that hopefully would really push people to you know push their own personal boundaries and uh, do the best. For, for those listening, you know, Dr. Sutton, He's he's and the program you're building there, Rajasri. Like you have to think that the materials that you guys have and that we have is it's it really those teachings formed a lot of my mentors, even like Dr. Sutton's a mentor of mine, obviously, and someone that's so inspirational in the industry. But if you think about this, like our agency, you has heads of our agency, like myself and others, who've actually worked directly for Dr. Sutton. So you're getting like some of the greatest live experience and, and real discussion topics and application, and probably if not the one of the most connected people in the world in sports. So, and also to think like Dr. Sutton could have done this anywhere in the world, but he obviously partnered with you guys and he talked about why this would be such a great program. So I think like if, if anyone on the call is serious about getting into sports and an industry in sport, I, I really don't know what better way you could do it than a program like this, where you're getting the art and the science and the access. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the delivery of Sportsman has been obviously getting like exciting in India, and I cannot wait to see what the next couple of months has in store with us. Um, we do not seem to have any more questions, but of course the floor is open. I mean, we can keep on talking about the program, but yeah, like if there are any more questions, we are happy to take it. And also happy to take any admissions related queries that might be there. Uh, I have one of the attendees, Mr. Prashant Pandey. I think he, Prashant, you have a question. You might have typed it in. Okay. Um, hi, Prashant. How did Columbia Business School help in accelerating? Okay. So how did Columbia help? <clears throat> what I would say is when, <clears throat> excuse me, guys. When I, I was working for uh, the basketball and hockey team in, in New Jersey at the time. And when I got my MBA at Columbia, I learned a lot more about all the other business fields. And I was in a room full of peers that were also executives in other industries. So what it taught me was to think way bigger than just ticket sales and sponsorship and marketing like I do at a team. It taught me to think about, wow, what can we do globally? How can we apply this to the banking and finance area, what we do in sports? How could you reach more people in the community through what we do? Because I met so many people that were earning multi-millions of dollars a year. They were CEOs, COOs, but A, they hated their job. B, they weren't great people, persons, or C, they just didn't know how to stitch it all together. So what I would say, uh, Rashid, is that I learned so much about <clears throat> Excuse me. I learned so much about how to think bigger 
I grew my contact base by so much. Like I have literally 200 classmates that I could text or email and they would answer in a heartbeat. I learned how to uh, grow outside of the confines of what I already knew in sports. Um, and it was really the best decision I ever made. What I will say is I think it really helped me in that program because it wasn't sports related that I worked for a while. So I worked for 10 years and then I got into the program. So I was able to, we learned about accounting and finance and marketing, and I could use and apply those things on a day-to-day -day basis because I was already managing the budget and managing people. Um, I think the beauty of with this type of program is that you will get that similar experience. If you're going to meet new people, you're going to learn different skill sets and you're going to network. I mean, I know if I'm one of the speakers you've heard from, and if you join these, you what if you got you have 10 of these or five of these even, you have five new executives that you can then reach out to that are in your circle just for attending the info set. I mean, that's crazy to me about the amount of networking and how much you can improve. So I would say Columbia was a game changer for me for that reason. Um, per, okay, then there was from Prashant, can a person with technical background enter this enter sports management? I mean, maybe for Rod industry, I, for me, I, I say yes. I mean, I don't think, you know, sales, there is no silver bullet, for example, in sales, marketing, sponsorship, unless it's a very technical job, but if you already have a technical background, even better, you learn on the job. So I would say that the more diverse the background is, the better it is, actually. Um, what I would say is, is to make sure to try to round yourself out. So if you, if you're great on the technical side, but not great on the people skill side, then work on the people skills. If you're great on the people skill side, not great on the technical side work. So in my opinion, I think the diversity of background is much better. Um, and I think it's great. Like, and I, I would certainly encourage you because sports management, you got to think a sports team has every function in it, like any other business, finance, accounting, community, PR, CR, sales, sponsorship, athlete represent. I mean, it's everything. So it's no different than a big company like, uh, you know, that sells cars. It's just our, what we sell is more fun. So in my opinion, but Rajshree, curious, curious yours, I think that that anyone, no matter how technically you are, could and should, should apply. Absolutely, Prashant. Uh, we have a question from an anonymous attendee who's asking about the resources of books and resources that you would recommend to improve storytelling. Hmm, that's a good question on storytelling specifically. Um, what are the books or resources you recommend on storytelling? Ah, oh, that's a great question. Um, Man, you stopped me on this one. What's a good book on storytelling? What? Let me, I'm going to think about that one. I don't know if you can find out who the anonymous attendee is, but I will send you some, some, some stuff after Rajshri that you can pass along. What I would say about the mastery of storytelling is it's, it's very fundamental. It's very, if you can't tell by now, I love fundamentals. So I just think about those seven things I talked about. Is it clear and concise? Are you revealing about your character? Is there a theme? Are you positive in your presentation? Are you putting your own flavor into it? So I actually think it is going through those characteristics and practicing over and over. So my journey of storytelling has, has hopefully gotten better just through drill and practice. I mean, if I tell that story, I mean, now I've probably told it thousands of times because people ask me like, oh, where are you from? Or how'd you get? I just take liberties. If someone says, where are you from? I don't just say from the US. I say, oh, wow, I live in London. I grew up in the U.S. and Canada, but I was born in the U.S. And I give open doors for people to, to get going through, um, to talk through it. So I think just practicing a lot, practicing in front of the mirror, practicing in the shower, practicing when you're going for a walk in the morning. I think practicing the story is so important. Um, that is the one thing that, that helped me on my journey. I, I wouldn't say I'm a master of storytelling, although that's a nice way to put it. But um, I think also getting to be more detail oriented like the, the presentation on the marathon I ran, I have an hour long keynote on that. Obviously I, I shared it with you in 12 minutes, but we get into the details where you can really feel the pain I was going through in that type of thing. And in St. Louis, like when we got people in tears, we actually, they felt that we cared about what they were doing. So 
I think that um, it's really about practicing and getting that message in there. Um, I listen to a lot of podcasts and I think that, but I don't know if any are necessarily, I think there's a guy named um, <clears throat> Ed Milet. His name is ED, or I can type it in there, Ed Milet. He has um, a podcast. It's one of the most listened to podcasts in the world. And he brings the greatest people on his, his, his podcast. And he finds a way to tell the greatest stories. Like he gets the most out of, uh, out of people. Um, so I really like him. That would be one place to start. And then one of my mentors is a guy named Jesse Itzler. I think I can, uh, can I type the answer here, Jesse Itzler. So I would, I would read Living with the Seal. If you like my story, I think you'll really like this book. And he's a great storyteller. So I don't know if I have any, as, as many great um, ideas of like a storytelling book per se, but I think there's that one. And then I also, this one, Ed Milet, I listened to his podcast and his book, The Power of One More, or, or this podcast or speech even right there. It's one of the greatest, um, one of the greatest, greatest uh, stories I've heard. The Power of One More, if you find that, audio podcast it's about an hour long hour 20 minutes it's one of the greatest stories i've ever heard um someone said there's a storytelling society in india i think that's great i've never went to these places but i think it's awesome like it, put it this way i'm an extrovert so if, if you think about me every day i wake up and i have this cup and it's empty and every time i interact with someone i get one marble and i put it in the cup and by the end of the day after all my interactions my cup's full and I have a great day. My wife is the opposite. She's an extrovert. She only has five marbles in her cup. And every time someone talks to her, she loses a marble. And by the end of the day, she talks to five people a day. She's, she's done. She's like, I, I don't want to talk to people. So for me, me telling my story, that's natural. Because I go out there, I network. I, I'm opportunistic. If you're not one of those people, then I think stuff like this is amazing. Like go to a place where they will entertain you. You can listen to stories once a week. You can tell a story once a week. You can get out of your comfort zone. So I think that's a great idea. I don't know it, but uh, I think Neil A said the storytelling society um, is a lot to learn. So I think that's definitely great. Um, is there another question? Let's see. Well, I still have 15 minutes, but if that, okay, here we go. What is the average package of Pressure. What is the average package? Of a, does, does he mean registry package like um, compensation or more like what's the, or maybe you can expand on the question? This is about the compensation, but uh, to be very honest, at this point about the GEO Institute, we cannot commit to a number. But, you know, the compensation is never like, you know, it cannot be compared to any other industry because people come in with their own sets of skills. And it's only a matter of time when they find the right kind of job with the right kind of package that they are really, you know, willing to take up. And we provide that opportunity for them to really connect, uh, to find the right kind of uh, uh, projects to work on. Uh, yeah, the internship and possibly you know convert that to the job at the end of the program. And the entire program is designed to keep in mind that everybody needs the right career, you know, like the start at the very beginning, and then they really make an impact in the sports industry. And that is why we talk about you know the skill gaps that they really want to uh, fulfill in India. And this is where this program, the way it has been designed, is into the picture. Yeah, that's great. How tricky to be managing an athlete? Yeah, I mean, we our firm doesn't do athlete representation, but I think um, athletes, musicians, professionals, they all have their different goals, motivations, aspirations. I mean, we all know like there's certain people that have a large social media presence and that's important to them. People want to make an impact in the community. Some people just want to play and never talk to anyone. So I think it's very much like managing um, a colleague at work or a, a big presentation. It's like what you have to do is find out what's important to the athlete, find out how to solve it and put the best system in place for them to be successful. So I, I think it's, it is very tricky, but at the same point, that's why there's agencies on the sports business side and the athlete side that 
work through these and they understand what are the hot buttons. So I think it all goes back to asking good questions and learning like you guys are doing now. We still do have the time and we are happy to take any more questions. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this is uh, again from someone anonymous and about the nature of jobs that are available. And of course, like uh, if I can talk about India, we have a mix of both. Uh, there are full-time jobs in sports, uh, definitely there. And this is where the industry is looking for the right kind of fit, the right kind of manager to join the workforce. And that is where a really, you know, like a progressive, uh, robust sports management program comes into the picture. It is also a fact that a lot of people do work in the event management industry as a freelancer. And that is something that's truly very lucrative and people do have a hang of going from one event to the other. And that's a very good working model. There's nothing wrong in that. But at the same time, uh, we do need people who are working full time with these clubs and leagues that are coming up in India at the moment. You know, we have multiple leagues running. We have multiple teams at the moment uh, within, the, within the Reliance ecosystem where we have the Rise Worldwide, we have the Mumbai Indians and several other teams. This is where the workforce is talking about the skill manager. So yes, it is full-time job. There are part-time seasonal uh, freelancing, but it's absolutely up to the you know uh, the applicant who wants to do a sports management program where they want to get into. Someone who sat in the recruiting chair of these roles, it's like. <clears throat> There are so many great candidate, good candidates out there, but there are not a lot of great candidates that know what they're doing and have the work ethic and the passion to go after it. So I think like I would rephrase that question that was asked to the person and say, I would say the other way around. It's like, if you want to make a full-time career out of this, you will. It's just a matter of how hard you're going to work and how much you leverage the program and, and what you learn. Um, so I, I think from a recruiting side of it, we're always looking for diverse and new talent and people that understand industry and have worked and networked. Um, so I think there's loads and loads of opportunities that will come up, not only through the Institute, but just because of the circle they're in and what they're doing. Um, as a 23 year old, what skill sets do I need to cultivate and enhance in order to thrive in the industry? Um, I look, I, what what I'll say is that I've, I've grown up in the sales, marketing, and business side of the equation. So take my answer with a grain of salt and, and how you approach it. In my eyes, I could hire a thousand people that are good at spreadsheets. I could literally hire a thousand people today that could be an analyst. I could hire hundreds of people that could be head of strategy. I could hire, you know, hundreds of people that know marketing. I could hire hundreds of people that know how to program. I could hire thousands of people that know how to do community relations. What you can't hire necessarily and teach all the time is how to build a personal connection. Someone who's got a natural motor to work hard and someone who practices fundamentals and is disciplined. So if you're asking me as a 23 year old, if I'm interviewing any 23 year old, I could care less what their skill sets are in technical because you're 23. I mean, you haven't, you've maybe worked for two, three years, maybe five years if you're, you know, you worked at the local corner store for six years, but you're not going to have any real skill sets that, that like you're going to be so great at something. So I actually think it's where I would suggest you work on is, is this, how do you present yourself? How do you, um, how are you in public settings? How do you communicate with others? How do you get in front of people? Like, for example, in my story, I didn't just quit after a week or two. I kept going after it. For me, like, here's an example. Are you, are you reaching people in the right way? So I'll give you a real example. LinkedIn, I get literally tens of messages a day. I'm not even that popular, but I get tens of messages a day. It's hard to read. Emails, I get hundreds a day. I, the, the place I see the most things is on Instagram. They use social media, but I don't get hundreds of messages. So if someone's actually trying to reach me, if they don't have my cell phone number, Instagram, I'll see before anything else. But 
people repeatedly just send an email and just quit after three times, right? Or they'll send a LinkedIn message and say, oh, Sean Doss never responded. Oh. So I think it's about how to understand, like learn those types of things to me, that uh, stuff is, 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 is where I would really focus on. Your personal, your fundamentals, your hard work, building that foundation, because like you will learn sponsorship, you'll learn programming, you'll learn finance, you'll learn accounting on the job. So that's how I would answer that. Especially if you join a school like this, you're going to learn everything from, you know. Um, Yeah, I mean, uh, I was just coming to that because for us in this program, we are looking at an age group of 21 to 30. And this is where partly what you've just shared with us comes into play. We'll have students who would be completely new to the scenario. We're expecting, you know, applicants who have come with a couple of years of experience, right? And this is where the peer learning happens. And this is where, you know, even if you do not have those technical skills, you still get to learn from your peer. You still get to go out to the industry, work on an internship and, you know, start developing those networks. And yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, end up with something that you really desire to start your career in sports with. 100%. Well, Sean, up for more questions? Oh, there's another one? Let me see, yeah. Sean, on at the moment. Hi, Prisha. Okay. Um, I'm sorry. In your 20s, how did you feed your curiosity? Who was your mentor for a journey? Oh, okay, great question. Um, so I'm a very curious person. Like when I, which is actually why you might not have seen it, but as soon as we started, I texted uh, Roger Street and I said, hey, I can't see anyone. Like, I forgot it was a webinar. So for me, like, I, I'm actually really curious to learn. Like I, I would love to put faces to the names of the people questioning. I know it's hard in this format, but so I'm genuinely curious. So I like to learn and ask questions. So I would think about like, when you meet people, um, are you staying in touch and asking questions? Like, are you asking people that you meet like, hey, tell me about the three biggest things in your career you wish you knew 20 years ago, now that you're a 40 year old man, you know, a woman or man that you're speaking to. Um, tell me about the best advice, you know, you were given. Are you asking questions? Like how did you get, how did you get to where you're at? What was your biggest challenge? What are you working on now? Who are your mentors? Like you asked. Um, so I think it's about, for me, I'm naturally curious. So I do that in my day to day. Let me give you one example. I don't do a ton of these speaking engagements like this, but if I speak to a group of a hundred people, and I give everyone my cell phone number. There will be five people that might reach out once. And after that, in a year, there's usually zero or one. And it's not about me. I don't care, right? Like, I, it doesn't bother me if someone doesn't reach out. But my point is, is like, for me, if I attended this, when I meet a CEO or someone, like, I text them, I email them, and I keep them in touch quarterly. Like, I'm asking them questions, and I'm learning. And I think, like, that's an example where, like, curiosity, sometimes you have to be proactive about it. So, and it may not be me, right? Like you may have got off the section and say, you know what, eh, good story, but I don't like him, but it'll be the next one you get to, right? You talk to Dr. Sutton, you're like, wow, that's, that's the guy I want in my circle. Then are you staying in touch with him? Are you curious? Are you asking him like, hey, Dr. Sutton, when you were my age, what did you do? Or how did you get from UCF to here? How did you do that? So I think it's about being deliberate about feeding your curiosity. Um, especially if you're not generally curious. My, my mentor, I have a few mentors. I, my, my father is one of them. I, I mentioned him. He does cancer research. He's very smart and disciplined. And I realized as I got older um, that I mean, I'm not that old, but I'm 37 now. I've got a few kids. And I realized once I had kids and things that I just started emulating what my dad did. So I'd see him working hard on Saturdays and Sundays. I see him always just executing fundamentals. In many ways, he was you know, being the Indian dad that's a scientist, he wasn't the most like cool dad or sports dad. But I realized that as I got older, those fundamentals are what made me successful. So he was one. Al Guido, the guy who gave me my first job with Coyotes, who I mentioned to you, he not only hired me in sports, he then, um, we started this agency together five years ago. And now we have 200 employees and we're all over the world. So it's pretty, pretty unique. And he's someone who I look to. He's one of the greatest people you'll ever meet. He's personable. He knows how to sell deals. He knows how to take care of people. 
uh, you know, and which is why Dr. Sutton and Roger Shree and everyone reached out to us um, and to him. Um, and then, and then the guy Jesse Itzler, I sent you guys his name. He is a uh, three-time entrepreneur. He he has a he sold a billion dollar or multi million dollar jet company. He sold a coconut water company. He's married to the founder of Spanx, which is a female um, undergarment brand, a billionaire, female billionaire. And he's an entrepreneur. He's an ultra runner. He does these crazy adventures. And he's taught me if you if anyone picks up that book I said, Living with the Seal. He's, he's taught me that there's so much more I can get out of life on a day-to-day -day basis, which is why I came here late. I did a run. I called my family. I did everything I said earlier because I realized I can fit so much more in a 24-hour day. And he really um, mentored me in that respect. So he'd be another one. Um, I got another one from Rashid. Uh, Rashid, any difference in dealing with the U.S. clients versus European? Or do they have a similar way of looking at sports business? I'm looking to understand the mentality of people running a football club in the UK versus people running the WWE. Okay, that's a great question. So here's the thing. There's, I would say, in general, the sports world looks at things similar, but there's one very, very big difference in European sports, specifically in football, than American sports. <laughs> in European sports, and you probably know this based on your question, but for everyone else, in an American sport, if you finish last in the league, you get the first draft pick. So that means you get to choose the best player available for your team. In European sports and European football, if you are the worst performer, you get sent down to another league. So that would be like playing in the IPL today. And I don't even know what second league cricket is in India. Then imagine you're the, uh, the Chennai Super Kings and you finish last. You go down to another whole league. So you lose TV money, you lose sponsorship revenue, you lose ticketing revenue. So what I would say is that European CEOs are much more focused on the play on the pitch as than they are on the business side, because the penalty of being relegated and dropping down is so bad. Whereas WWE or an American sports team, you have a bad big review or a bad show or a bad season, you can pick it up and, and make it go around the next year. So what I'd say is I think this is why American sports CEOs and people traditionally have the most commercially revenue-minded way uh, uh, of speaking because one, we always focus on the commercial side because if the play on the pitch is going to happen one way or the other and we can't control it. And we're able to focus on that versus some of the European CEOs are saying, you know what, if we lose three games in a row, we're going to be in the next league and that's not okay. So I would say that's the big difference. Um, outside of that, I would say they're very similar. It's just customs. When I worked in Spain the first time, funny story, I'm an early riser. So I came to work at 7.30. I was waiting outside the stadium in Atletico Madrid. They played at a stadium called Vicente Calderon in the south of Madrid. And I showed up at 7.30. And guess what? I sat there for two hours because no one showed up till 9.30. In America, I could have scanned my badge and went in at 7.30. So what I realized is the customers are different. They start a little later. In Spain, they take a two-hour lunch. They work later. So that's a custom difference. But at the end of the day, they still are selling. They're still making presentations. They're doing cold calls. They're marketing. So I don't think it's that different. But I would say as you go around the globe, you probably flex the last 20% of your um, the last twenty percent of your sales sales uh, foundation. So the sales foundation is the same, but that last twenty percent will be different in India. It's different in Europe. Different in America. And I think that is where this, again, this program, because we can come in with so much of that American perspective, a completely new business model in terms of our academics, the modules, et cetera. So that is going to add in that added, you know, dimension to the sports management education in India. Uh, a lot of time, you know, like uh, applicants who apply to one specific program do come with the experience in sports, either in working or they might have done any other program. So this is going to be that hopefully the game changer where we bring this new yes. new you know uh, method of delivering sports, designing sports, and of course the consumption part of sports. One hundred percent. Well, that was um, that was great, and I appreciate the engagement from everyone. If uh, obviously I, I've given the my email there, Roger, if anyone needs it or Instagram, they can feel free to reach out. But um, 
And if there's anything else we need, please let me know. But I enjoyed the time. Thank you so much. This is fascinating, Sean. And uh, hopefully, like, we get to hear more from you and make yeah. the conversation possibly somehow like more two way where you enjoy talking to people who we can see more. Yeah, well, let's get some of these people signed up and we'll all meet in India. It'll be fun to go home. So, definitely. So, have a good day and thank you to all the attendees who stayed back and participated in the question and answer series. Wish you a good evening. Bye bye. Absolutely. Take care. Bye.